The Ray Hanania Show is brought to you by the U.S. Arab Radio Network and sponsored by Arab News Newspaper, the Middle East's leading English language publication with print and online editions in Saudi Arabia, Dubai, France, Japan, Pakistan, England, and the United States. Listen to live radio every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern in Detroit, Washington, D.C., New York, and Ontario, Canada. Or watch the live broadcast on Facebook.com forward slash Arab of news. The Ray Hanania Show is rebroadcast in Chicago at 12 noon on Thursday. For more information on the radio stations, live Facebook broadcast, and podcasts, visit ArabNews.com. And now, here's your host, columnist and U.S. special correspondent for Arab News, Ray Hanania. And welcome. It's uh, Ray Hanania here at the Ray Hanania Show, Wednesday, hey, August 24. 2022, and I'm your host, Ray Hanania. We're broadcasting live in Detroit, Washington, D.C., and rebroadcasting tomorrow on Thursday, first in the morning on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, and then at 12 noon on Thursday in Chicago on WNWI AM 1080 Radio. We actually have two guests today. The first is Khalil Jashan. I've known Khalil uh, going back to the 1970s, he currently is executive director of the Arab um, uh, the Arab Center in Washington D.C. And uh, Khalil has been with many organizations. I, I really kind of look at him as a uh, somebody who probably knows the community better than anybody because, from my perspective, he was there from the start all the way till today. And uh, he was with the Arab American University graduates, uh, the AAUG. He uh, was with the National Arab Amer uh, National Association of Arab Americans, the NAAA. He's done stuff with uh, the a a ADC and other organizations. And now he's with the Arab Center in Washington, D.C. with a friend, Yusuf Munayer, who uh, understands journalism, I think, the way I do. Um, and we're going to talk with him about what Arabs need to do. What is it that we have to do to get things going? And then in segment two, I pre-taped an interview with Amr al-Bayoumi. Uh, Amr is an Egyptian-American actor, and he's going to talk about fighting and addressing anti-Arab and anti-Muslim stereotypes in Hollywood and television filmmaking. He's a voiceover artist. He's a producer. He's a professor. He was a lawyer, an international lawyer based in Washington, D.C., and uh, he's going to share a story about how he had actually booked a flight on that, uh, I think it was uh, American Airlines 77, Flight 77, uh, on September 11th, the night before he booked the flight, he was going to be traveling uh, out west. And uh, um, his mother uh, said, you know, you've been working too hard. It Don't go to this meeting that you're planning to do. Take a break. So he ended up not going on that flight, and that saved his life. He turned that into uh, a little... Uh, sh video short that's going to be available on his website. But first, let's go to our first guest, Khalil Jashan, Executive Director of the Arab Center in Washington, D.C. The early days uh, of uh, Arab uh, activism, uh, particularly on the political scene. I mean, the community, of course, as we know, uh, has been in this country for more than a century. And in terms of immigration, uh, the early years were totally focused on surviving, on, on cultural issues, on, on keeping the, the Arabic language alive. So we didn't uh, interact politically with, with our environment, if you will, or with the, with the system, with our new country, until almost like the, the, the 60s in, in a realistic way. And, and the first attempt we did, uh, of course, was the AAUG. Uh, in, in the late 60s, uh, and, and then other kind of groups began to emerge and to spin off uh, from that. I, I think the fact that we remained loyal uh, to our identity, we nurtured our identity, we tried uh, to fit in, uh, we've, done, we've done things right. I mean, I, I hate to engage in self-flagellation uh, <laughs> uh, to say everything we've done is wrong. I don't think so. I think we've done a lot of of things uh, that paved the way for greater things in the future. This is the way I would put it. It's not well, perfect. Well, it's kind of, 
I was going to say it's kind of an evolution, correct? Yeah, it's like yes, growing. of course. It's That's like what politics and... is. It's an evolving process. It's not just something, you know, you hit a plateau and that's it. We've made it in this country. No, nobody makes it in this country except on a gradual basis, step by step. And, and when you look back at, let's say, communities we feel are, let's say, better off than us or, or more successful uh, than us in terms of their political, social, economic impact, uh, we haven't done bad. I think we've done best probably economically uh, in this country. That's my impression uh, in, in the 50 plus years. Uh, I've been here, uh, but uh, politically it's been slow. Uh, but again, we've had some gains and, and they need to be built on. They need to be used as a foundation for a better future for our community. Yeah, and uh, I remember uh, Ibrahim Mabaluhud, he, he reached out to me, I think, uh, right after I got out of the Vietnam War, um, I wrote a letter that appeared in Time Magazine or Newsweek, it was in both, I think, Newsweek and Time yeah. Magazine criticizing U.S. policy in the Middle East. He read it. He liked it. He, he reached out to me. And I don't even know how he found me without the internet. They still managed to figure <laughs> out where I was at. And uh, he said, hey, uh, we want you to be involved. And the one thing he told me was, you know, we don't like to air our dirty laundry. You know, yes. Arabs, culturally, we don't like to talk about the shortcomings and the problems. And it wasn't until later that I thought, you know, that in itself was a problem because if you don't identify the problems, you don't correct them and you don't address it. Is that a problem still in our community? And I'm not trying to make you be negative about us, but mm -hmm. we have a tendency to not want to talk about things that are broken or bad or, you know, that are not working. Yeah, I think we go through periods, uh, frankly, as an ethnic community, uh, as a minority group uh, in a larger society. Uh, there are some topics uh, that tend to be taboos uh, and, and we like to avoid for cultural issues, uh, religious issues, uh, social issues, whatever. Uh, but generally speaking, on the contrary, I mean, I find the community not only willing, but sometimes obsessed, uh, dwelling on, on the negative, which I don't like personally. Yeah. Uh, I, I think up to a certain extent, constructive criticism is good uh, for any uh, social, uh, let's say, movement within any community. Uh, but when, when you look at it uh, in a broader sense, uh, we're not the, we, this is not unique to us. I mean, look at the Jewish community, for example, with whom we've uh, competed on many levels uh, for, for years. Uh, uh, dwelling on the negative, uh, they, they've made a profession out of it. <laughs> Uh, and hiding uh, their dirty laundry, they, they have also made an art out of that. Uh, yet, uh, they have been successful. And, and you know, especially uh, the joke is, uh, you know, when the camera is on, when the cameras are on, all of a sudden, boom, uh, all, all is well, and we're all getting along. <laughs> right. So yeah. there, there is, this is the nature of ethnic politics in this country. Sometimes it tends, tends to be very competitive internally and very critical and it has a negative aspect to it. Uh, I, but, I remember yeah go ahead. I was gonna say I remember also being told and I can't remember whether it was Ibrahim Abulud or somebody else that the Arabs have the best case but the worst lawyers. And that's yeah. kind of mean and the Israelis have the worst <laughs> case but the best lawyers. I've learned to interpret that to mean not the individuals are good or bad, but the communities uh, the, the Jewish community far better understands and engages the news media than the Arab American and the Muslim community. As Arabs, we don't, yeah. we haven't engaged at the same level. And oftentimes the news media is a bigger enemy of ours than even some in the, you know, the communities that we find ourselves disagreeing with. Well, the news. What do you media, make of that? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree at a certain extent. And as you know, uh, I've had uh, similar conversations with uh, Brahim, uh, particularly those two, three years where we taught together on campus there at North uh, Western. And uh, in, in addition to that, of course, many years we had uh, in common worked uh, with AAUG uh, at the time that was very active, and he was a leading figure and a founding father uh, of that organization, which I directed uh, in the early 80s uh, up in, uh, in, in Boston. So we've had that conversation. And frankly, yes, it is one of the factors. Uh, look, the media 
uh, from the perspective of an ethnic community is not just a profession, you, but, uh, but the media uh, is a tool, is a tool in, in that context, uh, in the context of building a community, communications within that community, and then that community's ability to communicate with the rest of American society. So if you understand the media, are active in the media, and, and uh, willing uh, successfully to work uh, with people in the media, that makes your work easier uh, and, and, and more, uh, more successful. It's not the only answer. Uh, when you talk about Brahim's uh, statement that uh, we have a, a just case uh, and a, the best case probably in the world, uh, yet uh, we, don't, we don't have the right, uh, say, representation or the, the legal representation to make our case, uh, it's, a, it's a bit more complicated uh, than that. We've had talented people. When I reflect back to, to the 60s, uh, we've had hundreds and hundreds of, of people uh, born here, who immigrated here, uh, who presented our case and, and made a great, uh, did a you know, great job. Uh, but uh, again, like you said, uh, the lines were not available. The lines were not open. The right mechanisms were not there. Uh, the timing was off. Uh, the community did not rally behind uh, some of these campaigns and so on. So there are many, many reasons. Uh, but uh, it, it is one factor that, that we need to, to acknowledge. Now, and again, I, I, I don't want us to be negative, but I always think in order to move forward, like I said, we got to address some of the problems. What are some of the challenges we still have to overcome? Yeah. What are, I mean, do we work together? I mean, when we talk about the Arab community, is there really an Arab community or we are in 22 different communities that mm -hmm. say we're together but are not? And then we have the layer of religion, Christian yes. Arabs, Muslim Arabs. We, we're all the same. We stand together. Mm -hmm. But do we work together the way we should be? Not the way we should be. Uh, we, we, we've made some progress in our ability to communicate and our ability to work together. I remember early on, let's say in the 70s and 80s, uh, we have been successful at, uh, uh, let's say, building a kind of least common denominator. Uh, I remember the efforts to set up the AAUG, for example. But there, what was the... Uh, uh, the nationalism that we imported with us uh, when we came to this country. So when you look at, at leading figures like uh, uh, the Abu Lughads of this world, the Edward Saeeds of this world, so that there was an element of, of Arab nationalism that brought together several thousand uh, leading figures uh, in the community at the time uh, that uh, began to, to really uh, come up with, with an agenda, a common that one could call an agenda in the modern sense uh, of, of the word that is not necessarily uh, sub-ethnic or, or, or religious in background, confessional, uh, that was viewed as negative, of course, in the progressive politics of the 60s and 70s. Uh, so it took a while uh, to get there, but uh, I remember the initial difficulty was the fact that there was already an elite, 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 elite in the community, mostly born here, mostly Syrian dash Lebanese. And then you get the, the new emerging elite, mostly educational, small business uh, that tended to be the new immigrants, if you will, of the 60s and 70s that uh, tended to be related to the 67 war. So by nature, uh, it was mostly either Palestinian or Palestinian motivated. Uh, but even the Lebanese, uh, let's say, newer immigration were different from the Lebanese community born here that came in the 1800s or the early 1900s. So a, a, a natural process of a kind of synchronization uh, had to take place. The, these communities, uh, went back to your question, is there one community or communities? I think there are communities. And these communities have, have uh, met each other, have learned to work with each other up to a certain point where there is one could say uh, that there is an Arab American voice. Uh, one community, not yet. Uh, right. An emerging community, yes. 
Is it is it possible that it's because we, many of the uh, Arabs that have come here have come as a result of conflict? Yes. Back home, so they bring the conflict with them, and they they're physically in this country, but mentally they're still back home. They yeah. want they're focused on back home. They're not focused on like the early Lebanese that came here yeah. in the nineteenth uh, century. They become very, very Americanized. I probably yes. would you say the Lebanese probably are the most Americanized out of all of them, um, yeah. or some yeah, of the I, professionals. I would say so. I would say so. The Syrian dash Lebanese, because frankly, uh, at the time there was not even that that precedes independent Lebanon. Uh, World War One, uh, before, during, and after right. that period. Uh, so it was all classified as Syrian dash Lebanese. Le Lebanon was emerging and didn't become independent, of course, till the early uh, 40s. And, and uh, people began to identify uh, uh, as such. Uh, but yes, the first phase of our immigration as Arab Americans tended to be uh, seeking uh, assimilation, acceptance. Uh, it was, as you said wisely uh, and correctly, that was uh, related to conflicts, it was related to famine before, it was related to economic crises uh, in, in the region. So it was an, an immigration, uh, several immigration waves uh, that sought to simply adjust, survive, and make it, and become part of this uh, American mix, uh, Did, mixed society, this, this fatouche. <laughs> I like uh, to call it a tabouli. It, it is. It is a but, tabouli, but Fatouche has additional ingredients. So. That's true. But do you think? Do you think uh, the uh, Arab immigrants have we ever really focused on being Arab American or yeah. American Arab as opposed to being Arab? Because honestly, I still think many of our community they love to read the news in Arabic. They go online. They read the Arabic. They get angry with the English media. But they, they tend to go back to where they were originally from, first and second generation. And yeah, do, we, yeah. do we recognize being an, an American is as important as being an Arab, I guess, is the yeah, question. Th that's, a, that's a very complicated uh, issue, frankly, and it's a very important uh, social issue. Uh, we probably should talk to, I wish our, our friend Edmund Gharib is with us, who's an expert uh, on, on this uh, because of his uh, family uh, connection. Uh, his father and, and, and uh, that generation was involved. First, the attempt to make sure that Arabic survives. They felt that if the language survives amongst us, then culture will, and then our Arab identity will. So they started, uh, I mean, the early phases of Arab of, of Arab American journalism. Uh, yes, it was in Arabic. And, and uh, not only that, it wasn't American, it was mixed. It was American and it was Arab at the same time. So these personalities uh, from Mikhail Naimi to Jibran Khalid Jibran were, were as well known in the Arab world, probably better known than here, uh, except in their own geographic location or communities. So it took a while, uh, it took a while. Then you, we had the recent immigration that you and I are part of and, and uh, were active in post 67. So that was more heavily biased to the Arabic language, but the earlier millions that existed before that, at least you know, one, one and a half million that existed up to the 60s or, or 70s uh, were mostly English focused. They didn't understand Arabic, they didn't speak it, they couldn't read it. Uh, so they, they were totally different. Uh, the problem we faced was uh, kind of mixing, merging the two branches, if you will, merging the two wings uh, of the community together. And we were successful in some aspects, but, uh, but failed in others. Khalil, if you had a magic wand, we have about maybe eight minutes. Uh, and believe sure. me, I, 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 I wish we had a five hour. I used to do a five hour radio show on WLS Whoa. in Chicago. <laughs> and I'll tell you, we talked about everything. The Arab yeah. community, uh, thankfully to the U.S. Arab Radio Network, Arab News and Leila al Hosseini in Detroit, we at least get this hour to talk about politics. Um, but I wanted to ask you if you had the if you had the magic wand to change things, what would be the three things you'd like to see the Arab American and Arab and Muslim community do better? First and foremost, activism. Frankly, uh, what delayed us 
uh, and slowed down uh, our progress in this country is our low propensity to be active, to be visible, to be involved in issues that are relevant to us uh, as a community. Why? Because particularly new immigrants, uh, there are two reasons. Those who were born here didn't know the issues. So they waited and waited and waited for the Holy Spirit to, to strike. <laughs> and those who came as new immigrants didn't know the system here. So they waited and waited and waited till a generation emerged that knew how to plug uh, into uh, the, the system. So I would say involvement still, when you look at us, three point whatever it is today, 3.7, 3.8 million people of Arab American uh, origin, uh, of Arab origin, uh, we're still not as involved as we should be. So when you compare us, let's say, to a Jewish community, which is about twice our size, and look at the involvement, where you have at least uh, 3 million American Jews involved in organizations that represent their interests, uh, we don't have that. We don't even have 300,000 Arab Americans involved. So, so the, the, issue ra is, the ratio involved. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, in other words, the issue. the issue is we have activists, but it's a small number. The majority of the community elite, doesn't elite look, yeah, the, and the majority doesn't see itself as wanting to be activists. They want to kind of merge mm -hmm. in the background below the radar screen then. They yeah. don't want to be the the focus of it. What, what's the, what would be the next thing you think? The next one would be giving philanthropy, uh, both kinds. Uh, philanthropy is humanitarian uh, giving. In other words, make sure that nobody in our community is in need. We are a successful community. We are proud of it. When I look at our biggest success as an Arab American community, we're doing well. We have done very, very well. But we have pockets of poverty. We have pockets of need, both uh, in, in, in the old uh, immigra immigration and in the new immigration, because frankly, the new immigration is kind of much more complicated than, than the old one uh, that didn't come here for a specific need. You have all kinds of political, like the, the Iraqi immigration, the North African immigration now. So we're not familiar with where they are and what their needs are and how complex uh, their life is uh, in, in America. So that's, uh, that's the other one. And uh, the third one, I would say, I wish the uh, non-confessional uh, tendency is, is stronger uh, within the community. I have, you know, as a person of faith, I have no problem with people having their own faith, uh, be they Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, uh, whatever uh, they are. But uh, at the same time, uh, not, all, not our identity shouldn't be colored by our confession. Uh, our religion shouldn't trump our politics, so to speak. I hate to bring his name, but... <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll come but, up with another word for that. Uh, yeah, that that's too. right. That's right. And uh, so uh, those three, I think, uh, are three elements that uh, were very challenging and continue you, to be challenging. You're correct. Uh, you're correct, I think, about the religious aspect. And and again, it's not a criticism of Islam or Christianity or all of our religions, but I think there's a tendency for the media to want to push the Islamic identity because in the United States, 75% uh, of Muslims are non-Arab. And I think it's a, Arab, a political thing about Arabs that is what is the focus of the problem. The media, I think, this is just my opinion, I don't think they like Arabs as much as they like Pakistani Muslims or Indian or South Asian Muslims? It's, it's not the religion. It's, it's basically a little bit more complicated. It's a mixture, I would say, Ray. Uh, I agree with you. You put your finger on an important uh, issue here. Uh, the media tends to oversimplify. American media differs from, let's say, you know, my experience with uh, uh, European media or even Middle East media. They don't like to delve into depth. If, if if covering you and your event and your identity is not of added value to me as a journalist or to my in journalistic institution, somehow I avoid you. It's just a headache. I, I don't have the time uh, to research you in depth. Uh, so unless you know how to present yourself and present yourself effectively, you, you drown on the sidelines. Uh, so that, that, that's, that's uh, one issue. 
uh, but we uh, we haven't worked. I mean, there were so many attempts at working with the media effectively, and, and I've been involved in quite a few of them, but they tend to be short-lived and, and, and of limited uh, value uh, thus far. But I'm very encouraged about uh, the new generation in terms of increased uh, activity. Uh, a, lot of, a lot more of our young people are going into journalism. I mean, you were a, a pioneer. In the Chicago days, particularly, there were very few, like you said, you're right, uh, who were involved. And you were one of the first that uh, I knew were, were involved in, in journalism. But today, I see hundreds and hundreds, uh, because frankly, I, I do use about uh, uh, 12 of them a year as interns uh, at the center. And uh, I, I love the talent they bring. I love the commitment they bring. And uh, good writers, uh, committed, uh, learning the issues. Uh, very high caliber, and, and it's very competitive. I mean, we get those 12 out of maybe 300 applicants. So wow. uh, there, there is a, a bright uh, young generation that gives me hope for the future. My guest with me is uh, Khalil Jashan. He's executive director of the Arab Center in Washington, D.C. Khalil and I have known each other going back to the 70s. Um, and uh, I would say, he's well, I hate to say senior, <laughs> um, because then it were, people think of age, but I would say he's one of the senior, the the conscience uh, of the Arab activist community, and in terms of dealing with our successes and challenges, uh, Khalil, it really was a pleasure to have you on the show. And like I said, I wish we could spend you know more time talking about this because I think Arab Americans need to understand these issues better than they do. But uh, is there a website? Uh, where people can get information about what you're doing at the Arab Center in Washington, D.C.? Sure. I encourage people to take a look at all the websites of all Arab American organizations. Frankly, there's a lot of information and, and our memory tends to be short. So if you want to know your own history, which is very important, uh, I encourage people to do that. Uh, our own activity, you know, we're a relatively new organization, seven years old. Uh, this year, we're having our, you know, uh, seventh uh, kind of annual conference. Uh, this is our seventh year. It's ArabCenterDC.org. Arab right. Center, one word, DC, all of them, one word, uh, .org. We are a think tank, uh, the only think tank uh, in fully uh, fun focusing on that. Our bread and butter is analysis. Uh, we, we're small, uh, relatively speaking. We have 11 full-time researchers plus another 10 or 11 uh, non-resident fellows, so about 21 people in the, on the team. And our bread and butter is uh, analysis, political analysis for think tanks, for people who want to learn about the Middle East, about U.S. policy in the Middle East, uh, for officials who are concerned about learning the truth about the region and the impact of policy. Uh, so I invite you. It's not a community organization per se. I mean, it's part of the think tank community, if you will. But we are proud of who we are. We are Arabs and, uh, and, and other supportive uh, people uh, among our staff. But we are Arab organizations. And we are part of a family of networks uh, called uh, Arab Centers. And, and we have colleagues. Uh, the headquarters is in uh, Doha, Qatar. Uh, we also have an Arab Center in Beirut. We have Arab Center in Tunis. We have an Arab Center in Paris. Great. Khalil Jashan, Khalil, thank you for joining us so much. Give a shout out to Yusuf Munayer. He's a great guy. Please tell him Thank I you. said hello. I look I forward will. to talking to you again. Thank you so much, Khalil, for joining us. Anytime. Greetings uh, to all of you. Thanks, Ray. Appreciate you're, it. You're, you're welcome. And uh, you're listening to the Ray Hanani show here at WNZK AM 690, WDMV 700 uh, in Detroit and Washington, D.C. And we're going to be rebroadcasting Thursday in Chicago. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I have an interview that I did with Amr El Bayoumi, an Egyptian American actor on fighting and addressing anti Arab and anti Muslim stereotypes. I'm Ray Hanania. We'll be right back right after these messages. Dot com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. لم يتمتع أطفالنا الذين ولدوا قبل الجائحة وأثناءها بهذا العالم الفسيح. ولكنهم الآن 
وبعد أن تم ترخيص لقاح كوفيد-19 للأطفال بعمر ستة أشهر وما فوق سينطلقون في أفقه الرحب هل يمكنك عمل فقاعات تحت الماء؟ أهلا بكم في المكتبة حان الآن وقت القصة العائلية هل تريد أقلام تلوين مع وجبة الأطفال؟ نعم من فضلك ودفتر الرسومات لقد تعرف على أصدقاء جدد لكنني لست خائفة مع لقاح كوفيد-19 الآمن والفعال والمصرح به الآن لعمر ستة أشهر وأكثر يستطيع طفلك الاستمتاع بكل ما يقدمه له العالم لمعرفة المزيد تحدث إلى طبيبك وقم بزيارة michigan.gov slash kidscovidvaccine رسالة من وزارة الصحة والخدمات الإنسانية في ميشيغان Enjoy the first Syrian-style cuisine in Michigan. At Damas Cuisine and Catering, you'll find a wide selection of Syrian foods and sweets in our menu, like frike, hoisi, grape leaves with steak, mishawi platter, hot mahashi, char-grilled kebab, shawarma, and much more. Get super-fast delivery from Damas Cuisine and Catering right to your door. Order online at damascuisine.com forward slash menu and track your order live. Damas Cuisine and Catering, 28841 Orchard Lake Road in Farmington Hills. Call 248-987-4985. I'm here Let's... with Amar El Bayoumi. He's an Egyptian-American actor on fighting and addressing anti-Arab and anti-Muslim stereotypes for actors. He's a filmmaker. He's a vo voiceover artist, a producer, professor, and international lawyer based in Washington, D.C., Amr, thank you, first of all, for joining us. And tell us a little bit about your background, what you've been doing in Hollywood. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, I've been a full-time actor for 10 years now. I finished paying off my debt from law school and uh, decided to pursue my passion, which was always there, even before going to university. And uh, studied acting in London and then moved to New York and uh, had some... Uh, auditions also in Los Angeles, and now I'm currently based in Washington, but I've done a lot of TV, film, theater, and voiceover work. Give us a little example of some of the things that you've done, you know, sure. in entertainment. Sure. I've made, I'd say a lot of big roles in smaller projects and small roles in big projects, and hopefully I'm leveling that off. Uh, I just uh, performed in an Apple TV series uh, that just wrapped shooting in New York City, uh, based on a New York Times bestselling novel called Dear Edward. Uh, it is, uh, the role is of a, of a falafel uh, truck operator. And I kind of shied away from it. It was a bit cliche. I wouldn't say it's racist or anything negative per se. But what I loved about the role is he th that character develops a very interesting relationship with the main character who's a 12-year-old kid. So that's absolutely fine with me. The roles I... Uh, decided to kind of outline was really the types of roles that I would not even audition for. And some are very simple and easy to identify. Others are a little more subtle. And of course, I mean, it's natural, right? I mean, especially we're kind of new in Hollywood in terms of Arabs. Now, it's interesting that uh, most of the actors I've seen have been Egyptian, Egyptian, mm -hmm. Egyptian Americans. It's been almost like a, a stereotype in a way that when you hear about an Arab actor, I automatically assume it's Egyptian. What is it about acting, first of all, that draws many Egyptians? I mean, we know the first one, right? Uh, Omar Sharif. I'll tell you, he was a big Egyptian-American actor mm -hmm. way back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The Egyptian film industry goes way back. I mean, it goes back to the 30s. It's always uh, viewed as the kind of standard in the Middle East, uh, film and television, I would say up until, let's say, the 80s, 1980s, where that was really the golden age of cinema in Egypt. But I, just to, to set the framework a bit, Ray, in terms of what we're talking about stereotypes, there's two, two kind of issues to identify. There's sure. representation of Arab artists in mainstream roles, which is something kind of that we, we are seeing up and um, uh, it's increasing, but not nearly as much as it as it should be, such as Rami Malek playing uh, the role of the, the lead singer of Queen. And the other part is how Arabs are portrayed as characters, Arabs or Muslims. So that's really the primary focus of my paper, but I do address this other idea. But really what we're seeing is a very narrow representation of Arabs and Muslims when they do appear as characters in mainstream film and TV. And that typically is as in the context of terrorism. 
And just to back up, there's uh, your fellow Illinois resident, may he rest in peace, Dr. Jack Shaheen. Of course. Uh, dedicated his entire career to documenting this, the history and then the evolution of this ugly uh, stereotype. And it started with the the you know lustful Casanova type, and then it turned into the subservient uh, middle person. Rudolph serving. Valentino. Yeah, right? exactly. Rudolph Valentino. Then, first, you know, and not even had, Arab, and not even Arab. Exactly. Exactly. That's the thing. Yeah, we 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 lose on all fronts. We we are represented in a narrow box as ugly or brutal or lesser or savage or violent terrorists, and when it comes to our own stories like Gods of Egypt and Aladdin recently, which got some press about how the producers regret not casting Arab actors. We don't even get to play those roles or we're just absent. We, we, there's, there's a great study called Missing and Maligned, the Reality of Muslims in Popular Global Movies. It's an Annenberg report done at U, by a USC. And it basically says, it takes a study of 200 popular films in uh, four uh, Western countries. And between 2017 and 2019, 1.6% of the almost 9,000 speaking characters were Muslim compared to the world population of 24%. Wow. So either we're missing or we don't tell our own stories or we're in this box of this ugly terrorist. So um, I've encountered that several times and I've seen an evolution of this, uh, this ugly terrorist character, you know, just the bloodthirsty, I want to destroy Western civilization. And I've also noticed uh, a, a, a feeble attempt at humanizing or showing balance where the the main the character is a bloodthirsty Taliban guy bent on destroying the entire world violently, but he has a soft spot for his daughter. Yeah. You know, like, oh, okay, spot. we've humanized them now, now. Now, isn't it, I mean, when you think about it, it's okay to have uh, uh, terrorist prote uh you know uh character in a movie what's not okay is and and i'm sure you agree that over the years we've only had that side that negative presentation of arabs and i'm assuming that the goal is to have a balance yeah you have mafia movies that present italians as mobsters yeah. but there's so many movies that present italians as smart rich cultural identity yeah. we don't seem to have that balance do we we don't do we, we have don't any have a... balance do we have no, any we don't. And um, my article, I, what I, my, my, my position is that this is part and parcel with U.S. foreign policy. You need to dehumanize people in order to oppress them, or just to put it simply, carpet bomb them. You know, bomb them back into the Stone Age. Right. As General said previous to the invasion of Iraq. You, you either they either don't exist, or if they do exist, they're lesser. This happened with the Irish when they immigrated here. The Native Americans, the uh, African Americans, they are somehow lesser. So you have these ugly images to reinforce it. And then it becomes almost like a chicken egg, showing it negative. Say, oh, see, that's what they look like on TV. So it's okay if we go and carpet bomb Iraq or uh, impose sanctions where half a million Iraqi children die. Uh, why not? It's, it's they're lesser. And that's to me, why I find these stereotypes outrageous. That what's why I refuse to participate in these rules. But Ray, just to add just the kind of layers though, because it's it's I think it's pretty easy for your audience to identify a one-dimensional Arab stereotype. What I've noticed uh lately is a new trend also, in addition to kind of the soft spot the guy has, he's a family man or she's a family, family woman, is uh, this pseudo balance where uh, Professor Evelyn Sultani of uh, USC, formerly at University of Michigan, wrote an excellent book about the post 9-11 attempt to, to, to show these fake balances where uh, you have a, the bad Arab, the villain, but you have a good Arab. Uh, who's the FBI agent? You know, Mo Jackson or whatever he may be. So it's balance. Uh, people say, see, they're depicting us in a good light. There's a good guy and then there's the bad guy. My problem with that fundamentally is the context remains violence and terrorism. Right. And of the 7,000 different kinds of narratives, it still comes back to that context. So I refuse to reinforce in the viewer's mind, it, it's just an inherent Arab or Muslim trait. It's absurd, it's ludicrous. No one people have this kind of trait. It's how it's portrayed and then how people are taught to hate 
And um, another layer which I cover is uh, actually not a stereotype per se. It is taking things out of context. And we've seen this with a, a, a lot of pieces, including the Broadway play Oslo and the band's visit. Arabs interacting with Israelis in some context that they have to interact and somehow learning to get along. Oh, you have eyelashes? I have eyelashes. <laughs> you drink milk? Oh, my daughter drinks milk. And all of a sudden, can't we just get along? But the fundamental problem with that, again, it's just cheating the Arab and Muslim narrative is we are eliminating the elephant in the room, the occupation, the apartheid state in, in, in Palestine um, that is uh, a, a part of the uh, Zionist occupation force. So again, you can do it different ways. You can just misrepresent, you can non-represent, or you can completely decontextualize where, well, what's the problem here? You know, oh, you're living under military occupation and your human rights are being violated on a daily basis. We're not gonna talk about that then we'll show us as equals. And I know a lot of Arabs and Muslims who saw those pieces and said, well, there's a grouchy Arab guy, there's a funny one, there's a shy one. They're humanizing us. Yes, they are humanizing us in a certain context that avoids any discussion of our fundamental human rights. I, of course, I grew up uh, watching hundreds of movies about the Middle East and Arabs, and every terrorist looked like one of my, I'd go to the dinner table and I'd look around and see my dad and my uncles, I'd go, wow. Yeah. You guys all look like the terrorists I just yeah. saw in the movies, the James Bond movies, the yeah. all these other movies. And I think well, that's terrible. I can, and I agree with you. I can imagine the impact that that message has on everyday Americans yeah. whose only contact and understanding of Arabs comes through books or Hollywood movies. Absolutely. And then when it comes time to invade Libya, Iraq, uh, uh, Yemen, uh, Afghanistan, uh, it's oh that makes sense they're all a bunch of terrorists anyway and yeah it's it's heartbreaking Ray it's it and for children to be raised on this I remember watching Bugs Bunny the Hassan Chop character it just it's vulgar it's shameful and being taunted at school and being called you know say Hassan Chop or sand n word and uh, you know we're gonna go bomb Iran and they sing it like the the the, the Beach Boys it's sad it's it, it it's not inherent it's taught to people and it is deliberate because it does go hand in hand with our policy so a lot of arguments about well stereotypes are all gone the jewish shylock or the irish drunk or the uh the america african-american pimp or the etc or the bloodthirsty that, that's all gone everything's fine now it is not gone it is pervasive and the number of rules that I've gotten that I document in my paper and my in my article, uh, straight up terrorist rules. And like I said, just with those little twists that are meaningless, it's just window dressing. And it, and it's not OK, as you point out, to have a negative stereotype and then one film where there's a positive stereotype only in the context of the negative theme. Exactly. That's not OK. It's that, not. But, it's not about an Egyptian squash player. And then you have a bad guy. I mean, it's and all the other things especially coming from egypt just the you know the the thousands of year history we have there's so much so then the question becomes well what are you going to do about it i am going to go out and expose them write papers and saying uh, here's what you're seeing and don't get don't get duped by this oh you've got some good arab characters in the band's visit and they're getting along with israeli characters but nobody's mentioning the occupation so it, there's always attacks and um, it's very unfortunate. The other one is just rewriting history, which I gave the example of in right. my paper, which is, you know, we go in and uh, invade Iraq after installing Saddam Hussein through the CIA, supporting his regime, uh, uh, doubling aid to him after he gasses the Kurds. And uh, then this whole hoax of uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction where Colin Powell is sitting on the seat of the security council and saying dry anthrax and then we go in and carpet bomb a country to the stone age as the quote was and um suddenly this guy's a bad guy we go and invade carpet bomb them starve their children uh which was justified by madeline albright on 60 minutes which is just appalling you do yeah. not have any public official in this country saying a statement that outrageous for any other people if it's arab or non-arab or non-muslim there would be riots in the street. 500,000 dead Iraqi children. I mean, absurd. And it's yet it's said and it's accepted. Yeah, it's terrible. 
Um, isn't it? Uh, let me play the devil's advocate just a little bit. Sure. Isn't also uh, it partly our responsibility as Arab Americans to do something about it? And I know that as an Egyptian American, you come from a history where movies are embraced in Egypt. They're recognized for the power and the voice. I remember growing up that it was a movie called Exodus that mm -hmm. defined the Palestinians as the bad people and the Israelis and the Jewish immigrants as the good people. So right away, I recognize that movies have a powerful influence as strong as the news media. Sometimes we only talk about the news media and complain about Hollywood. But are we doing enough to get people into acting and to pressure the industry to hire our people to make movies, as you point out, that I think is great? Um, this idea that maybe there is a bad guy who's not Arab. Mm -hmm. And the good guy happens to be an Arab. Yep. And that Arabness has nothing to do with the context. We're as good as everybody else, right? We are. And it's sad to have to say that, you know, just from the get go, Ray. I mean, just, we're equal and we, we, we love our fellow men and women and, and we, we treat each other with respect. That's just an ideal. That's, that's not only that, it's an international <laughs> law of human rights, just basic human dignity. And yet it still goes on. And, what to do about it? Yes, expose it. There are several organizations that monitor these things. The American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee uh, has a database where you can enter. The late da Jack Shaheen had done an amazing amount of work. So I welcome uh, the chance to be able to expose these issues and to offer my support to fellow Arabs and Muslims who want to become artists. I'm you Maybe because I was a lawyer for 20 years and becoming an actor just really to me is it's such a pleasure that I go out of my way to be supportive of anyone, uh, uh, especially Arabs and Muslims that are interested in being artists and being involved and writing their own stories. That's really my ultimate message uh, to younger and older generations. We have, we have to tell our own stories. That's the only way around it. You can't wait for Hollywood. It's a business. Yes, if it's if it's good for their demographics to to cast a uh, a Pakistani uh, Marvel character right or an Indian um, uh, superhero because the demographics are good and they're gonna you know they, they're gonna tap into uh, you know hundreds of million people because they've cast an Indian. So I'm not being cynical. It's just a fact. And as long as we our foreign pol policy is aggressive towards Arab and Muslim countries. This will go hand in hand to it. It's, it's essential to have these two things working together. So we as a community need to start telling our stories. I mean, here we go. Ray, this little thing right here. Right. Basically, uh, like 1950, everything of film studios packed into here. So we have the ability to tell our stories and in the context that we want, not in the context of the predefined stereotypes. It doesn't have to be about the veil. It doesn't have to be about female circumcision. It doesn't have to be about violence. It can be about a hundred thousand other things. And that's where the creativity comes and that uniqueness of our story and of our culture for crying out loud, look at the Arab world, just the different faces. If you look at a mosaic of you know, blonde, blue eyed and, and dark skinned and the different religions and the different uh, geographical uh, terrain and locations and, and history and food, it's, it's unlimited. Uh, so it's really up to us and those who are in the industry to appreciate it's about human stories. You want to make a ton of money on it? Okay, tell a good human story. Yeah, I mean, it was a choice I made many years ago when I was in uh, college after the serving during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to be a doctor like my cousins and uncles. I decided I'm going to be a writer, even though I couldn't write. Yeah. I had to force myself and I, I succeeded in it. But the, it's so important, as you point out, that we have to tell our own stories. Yeah. And, and I understand you have a story that uh, is on your website. Tell us about yeah. that. I have a short animation film that I made last year about my near miss uh, during 9-11. It's called Close Call. It's in uh, a few uh, prominent film festivals now. And again, practicing what I preach, I'm going to tell my own story. I think it's a very interesting idea that me as an Egyptian American Muslim almost died in 9-11 had it been had it not been for my mom, thankfully. I had been working as a lawyer, completely burnt out, and was going to fly to visit a friend in LA. 
but my mom saw me after having lost a lot of weight, uh, not sleeping and the usual lawyer stuff. And I told her I'm going to go visit Jim tomorrow. She said, no, you're not. She stopped me there and just said, you are not going. And the next morning was 9-11. So that plane I was supposed to go on was American Airlines Flight 77. So that's the seed of my film, Close Call. And she wanted you not to go because she saw you being drained a little bit. You needed the rest. And yeah. You were overworked. Overworked and I had lost 40 pounds. I mean, wow. yeah, so I didn't look good. I looked pale and, uh, you know, my friend knew how to push my buttons and say, it's going to be a fun party. You got to come. And I, I hadn't, I was sleep deprived for, for months. So, uh, had they booked you? Had they booked not, you on, were you booked? On I was flight? booked. I was booked and wow. uh, I canceled the night before. And, um, that's an example of just telling our story. So like, it's especially, what struck me in visiting the 9-11 memorial when you enter i thought it was going to be kind of u.s patriotism and all that i thought it told a very different story it told a very human story yeah. and you're really struck st struck by the entrance is the flags of the countries of all the victims it looked like the u.n you know and then you look at the photos of all the victims in the uh in the victims gallery at the thing and it just proves the point we are all part of a community you know uh arab uh, or muslim terrorist well here's an arab and muslim guy that almost was a victim of it luckily for his mom kind of jumping in and intervening but that's what's compelling to me about that story it's really us up to us that are those who are marginalized to unify forces even if it's at the level of labor unions and and you know it's not just Unfortunately, Ray, things have become so compartmentalized uh, where, you, you know, you've got people on social media kind of in their little echo chambers and connecting the dots as to how oppression works. And that's really what was a great learning experience for me writing this paper is the history of, of disenfranchising or marginalizing people. It goes way back. Read uh, People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn or read I highly recommend the book called Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, which takes a look at the marginalization of the Jews by the Nazi regime. Of course, African-American and during Jim Crow and slavery is the primary focus. And then finally, the actual caste system in India. And it's remarkable to see how it works and to understand it. And then you add this mechanism, this kind of driving engine, which is stereotypes and film and propaganda and being keenly aware of it. And knowing the context it's not just some savage looking character there's other ways of doing it and the other example i was giving is of kind of rewriting history with this film the devil's double that i was asked to audition for like i said the whole history of our support of iraq and all that no mention of that in the film it's just these are bad guys saddam and his sons and uh they're out causing chaos and then the u.s soldiers come rushing in and spray spray them with machine gun fire and then the square of Baghdad is flooded with Iraqis waving American flags, chatting USA, USA. So they're not really telling a story. They're pandering to what they believe the public yeah. believes is the story. They're giving yeah. them what they think is there rather yeah. than telling the reality of what really happened. Yeah, that's what they got fed when they saw CNN covering it. And, you know, I just what what I find very telling, I, I'm against any use of force. I I I. I denounce any violation of international law by any government or regime in, in any context. You cannot sit and pick these issues like it's a salad bar, like, oh, I don't like that, but I like that. It, it just, you, you have no credibility. But what always struck me is how I was watching when I was in law school, the bombing of Iraq at night. And it was like the, the, the narrator was, was covering a fireworks show. Mm -hmm. And yet when you see the bombing of um, Ukrainians by Russian forces, it's tragic. It's all tragic, everybody. And um, that's the double standard. And that, when you start thinking about why do they have these stereotypes, that's really the focus of my paper is why, not what are they? I think everybody can figure out what it is. You're just trying to demean and dehumanize and belittle people through distortion, but why? And then you we, that's when you get into the context of uh, these massive invasions. And um, again, uh, not a perfect example of a stereotype per se, but uh, this film, the, the the play and the film, The Kite Runner, I was asked to audition for the new Broadway show. And I really had mixed feelings because it's a nice story. Uh, 
But I just found it very curious that after 20 years of occupation by our U.S. forces, you know, with my tax taxpayer dollars and yours, that we decided to put up on stage a play about the brutality of the Russian invaders and the Taliban. After 20 years of occupying this country and really feeding the military industrial complex with trillions of dollars and tens of thousands of lives lost and nothing being done. It's this democratization and everything. It's did nothing. you decide? Did you did decide not, not to take it? I didn't. I had mixed feelings, to be honest. It's like, okay, okay in, in a vacuum, it's a nice story and everything. I'm not saying I would have gotten the part or anything. I was asked to audition for it. I just thought that was more of a gray zone choice for me where, you know, I, I'm an actor. I want to work, of course. But um, it just pained me that that's the focus now it's almost like the, the shell game of okay look over here everybody R forget about what we did for 20 years where we could have funded education and health care programs for for the, the those in need in this country people of all races and and ethnic backgrounds and religions uh instead no the military industrial complex grows and grows well we're still subject to um uh an industry that requires a lot of money and I, I just don't see the Arab community stepping up and putting up the money to create the movies that we need, that you and I and, and all the Arab and Muslim community know should be made. Isn't that part of the problem that our, our community, do they recognize how important this is outside of, oh, that's bad, I don't like it, to the I, point where let's do something about it? Yeah, I mean, it takes it's hard because the context, it almost becomes like self-hatred where you want to dissociate, you see this, and it happens with the African-American community. Isabel Wilkerson writes about that. Everything in the fabric of, 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 of what resulted from you know, slavery and this white supremacy, also the, 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 the subproduct of that is self-hatred. Everything you see around you, there's lesser. White is good, black is bad. Um, uh, you know, these Arabs are savages and they're unsophisticated. I mean, that's the typical image. So coming to the united states any immigrant group has this kind of choice unfortunately where you're going to be more traditional than folks back home or you're going to be all american and kind of rinse yourself of your identity i think that's a shame because the beauty for me is the diversity of this country and that's what gives me hope and it's a struggle it has its cycles right. uh, but you can't give up on humanity uh, and, and decency and equality my guest, Amr El Bayoumi. Uh, Amr, do you have a website where people can go to follow your career and see what's up and where you're going? Sure. It's AmrElBayoumi.com, A M R E L B A Y O U M I.com. And uh, again, uh, it was a pleasure being able to share some some discussion with you today, Ray. I really uh, appreciate it. My pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Amr. Appreciate you joining our radio show. All right, everybody, uh, I want to say thank you. We will see you next week. Thanks for listening to our show. I'm Ray Hanania. Bye-bye, everybody.